Hello, this is Miss Kyler again, and I'm going to be talking to you today about Tam Shanter by Robert Burns, and the format is a mock epic. And just a little note about Robert Burns. Robert Burns was the national poet of Scotland, and whereas before most of the poets of the of the earlier era had been um, higher class people, educated, who used the more grand style of language in their poems, Robert Burns was just a simple farmer who used simple Scottish dialect to write his poetry and to uphold the value of the common man and kind of make fun of snooty upper class people on the way, as you saw in To a Louse in the earlier le in the lesson. So in order to understand a mock epic, you really do need to know what an epic is. And you may have already studied epics in another time in another class, but here's a review. So an epic is a long narrative about a serious subject. Its diction is elevated in style, and it usually focuses on the exploits of a hero or demigod, and the demigod or hero represent the cultural values of a race, nation, or religious group. The fate of nations hinges on the hero's success. The setting is usually vast in scope, covers a wide geographic area, um, there are usually superhuman feats of strength or military prowess. And gods or supernatural beings frequently take part in the action to affect the outcome. And in the poem, there usually is an invocation to the muse to inspire the poet. So it's kind of like a prayer to an appropriate supernatural being, asking them to provide suitable emotion, creativity, or words to finish the poem. Sometimes they actually do cry out, oh muse, inspire me. Sometimes they actually talk to a goddess or a god of art or poetry to help them. And it usually starts in medias res, which is in the middle of the action, and then it fills in what happened earlier through the use of um, flashbacks. And the epic employs extended similes. These are called epic similes at appropriate spots of the story. Remember, a simile is a comparison that uses like or as, like she ran like the wind. And an extended simile or an epic simile would say she ran like and go on a whole stanza telling you what she's running like. So that would be more a big way of doing a simile. Okay, so that's an epic. Now epic just takes all those and uses them to make fun of the seriousness of epics. So in contrast with an epic, a mock, mock epic is a long heroic comical poem that merely imitates features of the classical epic. They usually do use an elevated style of language, but they're applying it to mundane or ridiculous objects and situations. The mock epic focuses frequently on the exploits of an anti-hero, so whereas the epic has a god or a superhuman being, um, usually some little commoner doing some silly little thing in the mock epic. And it usually illustrates the stupidity of the class or group he represents. Um, there's usually the invocation of the muse, intervention of the gods, long catalogs of characters appear in the mock epic as well, but that's only for the um, effect of being of spoofing the epic. And Tam O'Shanter, I'm not going to read it because it's rather long, but I want to point out key things. And it may be a little difficult at first for you to read because of the Scottish dialect, but I did provide um, some, some of the key words here on the side of each of these slides. So you can see, oh, there's a translation there. And if you read them out loud, it's not as difficult because you start realizing, oh, it sounds like a lot like the word it really means. Like, talk sounds like take. And Ian will sound like, you know, even, and so forth. Um, but you notice that it does start in medias res, which is in the middle of the action. So we already start with Tam getting ready to leave the, um, the bar, the pub, where he's been getting drunk. and but he has been there so we later on we find out he's been there for weeks on end talking and drinking and partying after selling his wares and um so they we but so we're already there in the middle of the action getting ready to embark on his dangerous journey and we notice that the language is grand in style which is spoofy in other epics if you know like like beowulf or the odyssey or paradise lost or even if you watched movies like the matrix even the story of Christ, those are all epics. 
And it's interesting here to note where he's talking about his, what is he embarking on, his dangerous journey. Well, he has to get home and face his angry wife. And, of course, him coming home drunk is going to make that a very dangerous um, exploit indeed. And it's kind of interesting. I kind of think the way that they describe her, gathering her brows like gathering storm. She's a sulky, sullen dame. Almost reminds me of Randall's mother, um, you know, waiting outside on the outskirts of the of fens in Beowulf. And, um... Tam O'Shantern is our hero. He's not a god. He's not Superman. He's just a foolish drunkard. And um, we have a little prophecy here. Many epics do have a prophecy told about the hero. And here Jean is someone who told him that, that later soon he would be found and he'd be found deep drowned. He'd be found drowned or he would be caught by warlocks by the haunted church. So, so there's foreshadowing that something bad could happen to Tam. So beware. And kind of a little message here. Ah, oh, gentle dames, it gars me greet. It makes me sad to think how many counsels sweet, how many length and sage advices the husband from the wife despises. So this whole thing isn't about, you know, the interventions of the gods in the life of mankind. It's more about Oh, foolish men, you go out and get drunk and you don't listen to what your wife said. You're not behaving yourselves. Naughty, naughty. Um, so, um, he's going along. He's feeling victorious. He's getting going to go home and be brave. And there's this epic simile. It says, pleasures are like poppy spread. You see the flowers bloom as shed, or like the snowfalls in the river, a moment white and melts forever, or like the borealis race that flit ere you can point their place, or like the rainbow's lovely form and vanishing amid the storm. So that whole um, simile takes that whole chunk of text that the bracket encompasses there. And then we get back. And then, just like that, you know, time nor tide waits for no man, so... Tom must ride. He must go forth. And his quest is to brave the storms while drunk to face his angry wife at home. There's lots of foreshadowing going on here. And Meg, he's on his gray mare, Meg. So most epics you have, the hero has some kind of tool that has a name. Beowulf has his sword fronting. King Arthur has his Excalibur. What does Tam have? He has Meg, his gray mare. And his old bonnet, you know, his Scotch, he's wearing his good blue bonnet, which is the little hat that they wore in the 1700s. Lots of foreshadowing here, the ghosts and owls crying. And he's, this kind of, this part right here reminds me of Ichabod Crane crossing the bridge in Headless Horseman, the place of evil, where a lot of violent crimes have been committed. And so that gives you the feeling that maybe ghosts of tormented spirits are haunting it. It's a dangerous place where people, bad things could happen. This is a place where Charlie broke his neck bone and, and um, the hunters found a murdered child and Mungo's mother hanged herself here. So a lot of bad things have happened. Now all of a sudden he hears laughter and dancing, so he stops in the shadows, kind of hidden, and looks and sees what's going on. Um, and right here, John Barleycorn, it says, Inspiring Bold John Barleycorn, uh, that's a name for whiskey. So they call whiskey John Barleycorn. Of course, when they're talking to John Barleycorn as if it's a real thing, real person, that could respond, what is that? Can you guess? Yay, it's an apostrophe, just like we had in the last lesson. Okay, and what does he see? Warlocks and witches in a dance. Okay, so he comes upon this evil coven where the witches and warlocks are dancing, and they're not dancing the fancy European dances. I think that's funny that uh, Robert Burns makes a big point to make fun of or the snooty European dances. But they're dancing good old common Scottish reels. And Old Nick, which is... Satan, there's the devil, and 
the devil's in the shape of a beast. And you first think, oh, the shape of a beast. He must look like a wolf or a snake. No, he's in the form of a big shaggy dog and playing the bagpipes, no less. So you imagine this big shaggy dog with a tam shanter, which is like the little Scottish beret playing the bagpipes. Pretty silly. And this, you know, they talk about, oh, heroic Tam in the grand style. Emphasis on his heroic heroism, even though he's just a silly goof. And they talk about the holy relics, not really holy, the evil relics that are there on display. And what's happening is they are initiating someone new to their coven. Um, and he's watching and he's curious. And he sees... Uh, the witches are dancing wildly and they're throwing off part of their outer garments and acting just really crazy. But the witches, are they're not pretty or desirable young women, but they're old hags. And he says, I wonder, did not turn thy stomach? Because how could you stand looking at them when they're these old women acting like they're, you know, some young, foolish woman? But there's one winsome wench who happens to be young and pretty. And she's dressed in a skimpy undershirt. They call it a cutty sark. Cutty means short. And sark is a shirt. Okay. And um, as he's watching and getting excited about watching this young woman dancing, all of a sudden we inter interfere with this um, spoof of the invocation of the muse. But here my muse, her wing must cure. Such flights are far beyond her power. So instead of saying, help me, muse, he's saying, well, this is even beyond the power of the great muse to speak and explain how this happened. Um, and as he's watching, drunk and excited, his drunkenness is his fatal flaw. Um, he sees her and he gets so excited he gives himself away. He shouts out, well done, Cuddy Sark. You're like, yay, go girl. And that, of course, gets everybody to notice that he's there. And they all come racing after him, chasing to get him. And it is up to Meg to carry our hero to safety. He has to make it to the bridge because, like legend says, witches and warlocks and goblins and such cannot cross over running water. Okay, they get there. They cross, and as they spring to safety, um, Meg gives her tail a, a shake, as if to say, ha! So there, I made it, ha! But that's her undoing, as the, one of the goblins catches Meg by the tail and cuts her tail off. Very sad. Left poor Maggie scarce a, a stump. And at the end, we have the moral of the story. Now who this tale of truth shall read, each man and mother's son take heed, when e'er to drink you are inclined, or cutty sarks run in your mind, think you may buy the joys over dear, remember Tam O'Shanter's mare. If you are tempted to get drunk and start dreaming of skimply clad women, just remember the poor tale that his mare lost. And so you can see the Mock Epic by Robert Burns. Please take time to read it again and get the full impact of the poem. Thanks. Bye.